Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get this meeting started. So I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. This is the Assembly Committee on Housing and Homelessness. We're noticed today from 11 to 12.30 p.m. in the Assembly Chambers. Let's go ahead and start with introductions, uh, starting with Mr. Peterson going across the dais. Daniel Bullock. Austin Davidson. Kevin Cross. Felix Guerra. Randy Zoll. And I want to note for the record that Mr. Constant is excused. I just want to double check. Do we have any members on the phone? No, no members on the phone. Okay. All right. Uh, we have, uh, so next on our agenda, we have initial audience participation. We have one individual signed up, uh, Mr. Oliva. So if you want to come on up, you will have three minutes. Welcome. Good morning, Ron Oliva. Did you give a little hand on this? Okay. <clears throat> First and foremost, I again will repeat to buy my property. Why? Because you stated you were do it. We did the study. You assured me on the previous sale. Uh, Felix, huh? I think it was, they're muted now, so go ahead. Pardon? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, so I wrote it down. And where I'm at today is uh, unfortunately the dominoes had fallen. Uh, the umpire called me out, but I was really safe. The judgment on two dead trees has now surpassed. 400,000 and 650,000 is going to be spent on this, but I'm out of cash. So they drained my accounts, swept them, they leaned all my properties, uh, and now they're forced selling my property, which is third neighbor. Uh, it's a good opportunity. I gave you this for sale. Uh, I gave you the name of the collection attorney. Uh, he was assigned a case by $650 an hour attorneys uh, from Ashford and Mason. So I listed the cases and it's an opportunity uh, for who's ever interested in the property. And if you could help me out with the difference, that will pay this judgment, which has basically destroyed my family life, spiritual life, and the business. So if you say you can do no harm, believe me, you've done it and done it substantially. The other point is, is I should always offer solutions. I've tracked this homeless issue. I started help with the shelter, the mission. Catholic Charities of Southern Nevada has a model that there's no homeless in the Las Vegas. And their program I submitted to homeless coordinator Daryl Tass years ago. It's a three-tier program that accolades homeless back into society in a positive way. The point here is that Chubiak Electric is now selling their North Campus, which during the time of Jim Posey would have been an excellent campus for homeless services from navigation to what the Hope Kitchen was trying to do, the Hope Center, looked at my property for a transformation center now you have an opportunity to use MLP funds to purchase those buildings. And you can cover everything from housing, training, uh, stores, uh, automotive uh, training, etc. It'll work. What you're doing now is headed for failure. And I really appreciate any financial help. This is an opportunity to get me all. I'm done. Uh, Do you understand that this legal issue swept the earnest money 
which was 250,000, I needed a place to move. I came to the San Leader Railroad, even to Wagner and asked them. It was a no win. Then it got into the environmental contingency, and I have contracts with the city ADS. I had to move off to complete the sale with yeah. no funds and no place to go. I don't know all of the details, but I just know we have tried. And so I appreciate you coming here, and I, I know it's a sure. struggle. But, thank but, you, but. but you haven't given me any money. You well, just you give it to the other people the money, and hey, I was first in line to be sold out, not by Wager, grasp the sin and the city, as promised by Robin Mark, Pam Weiss, and Berkowitz. Well, thank you for being here. I know we have a package of it, but I just wanted to say that to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levi. Any other questions? I don't see any. Well, thank you, Mr. Make sure you read the handout of all those attorneys, because I'm done. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to you, Felix, but you ruined my life. All right, so uh, just uh, for the members, if you want to uh, get in queue, please text me. That's probably the easiest way to get in queue. Um, so, before we get started, much like last month, we have a heavy agenda focused on the immediate issues in front of us, as well as future work, work uh, namely housing. I don't want to rush any of these conversations. So, like last month, if we don't finish up a large chunk of the agenda, I will call a special meeting. Likely not next week, because many of us, including myself, will be in Juneau, but probably the week after next, to finish up the agenda. So with that, uh, let's move on to unfinished business. Uh, so first, uh, the only item we have is the emergency shelter plan implementation and demobilization with a, a variety of sub items. So the first uh, on the list is the demobilization timeline update. So last, last month, I presented a demobilization timeline based on the information presented to this committee. For folks who want to look at that, you can find that on, on the Assembly's website. If you go to committees, uh, Housing and Homelessness Committee, you can find that there, as well as any other presentations that we have today. When we receive those presentations, they will be put up on the website. Um, several adjustments were suggested, and as I understand it, um, Maybe I'm wrong, but as I understand it, the uh, ACEH is working to keep a fairly current timeline for policymakers to use. Um, so I'm wondering, does ACEH have any updates that you all can speak to uh, from what was presented last month? Good morning, Ms. Ellen Tell, Executive Director of the Acres Coalition and Homelessness. My understanding is the Emergency Shelter Task Force um, has reviewed the demobilization timeline um, and information presented by Ms. Johnson and uh, AHD. They are going to be taking that back up on Tuesday, the 21st, because Monday is a holiday. Um, so if you meet again at a special meeting, they'll be prepared. But they may also consider providing some written feedback. Got it. Thanks for that clarification. The Emergency Shelter Task Force is the one that's working with that. Thank you. Um, so I guess for the benefit of the body and for the task force representatives who are here, does the administration have any updates uh, with regard to the demobilization timeline that you would like to speak to? Thank you for the opportunity for the chair. Um, we are still on track. Uh, the only thing that we, I believe, have added is if we, um, if it's the will of the community and the will of the administration, and hopefully with the approval from the assembly and also the coalition, if there is an appetite for um, an RFP for an outdoor safe sleeping site, that would require about 17 weeks of lead time. There's ways to go shorter, but that would be our only request. Everything else is on the April 30th demo timeline. Okay. Thanks, and for that may have piqued some interest. We're gonna to get to that here in a minute. Um, so any other discussion regarding the demobilization timeline update? Sounds like, um, and I guess part of the, just to provide the context, part of the reason why this is important is it's not just uh, a timeline update, it's also getting a better understanding of when things are closing and when things are coming online um, so that we can really understand the scope of the situation, uh, the human scope. 
um, and the uh, system scope of the situation. So uh, looking forward to getting uh, a more uh, detailed timeline here soon. Um, so Mr. Soltz, did you want to speak to what the administration just said? Yeah, we're going to we're going to be getting to the plan soon. Do you want to? OK. All right. If there's no one else for the timeline, then the next subject is the plan. So um, the administration's demobilization plan, as many are aware, the current emergency shelter system, if AR 2023-43 is approved, will be funded through the end of April. Um, there was no plan for beyond April, so a demobilization plan was requested of the administration. Preferably, as I have shared, the plan should focus on getting to the permanent solution as quickly as possible, which is housing. With that, I will turn to the administration for their presentation. And I just want to confirm, is this presentation up yet on the website, Mr. Turner? Okay. Um, then, yeah, let's try to do that as quickly as possible so folks following can look at that presentation. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alexis Johnson, uh, English Health Department, and I'm joined today by Michael Hughes, who also works in the Housing and Homelessness Division at AHD. Um, today, we're going to be presenting a proposal on demobilization um, for all the emergency cold weather shelters. Uh, next slide, please. You can go to the next slide. Perfect. So on the agenda today, we're going to talk about some background information for 16,020. I know some of members, um, are up to date on this, but for the community, $16.20 is what is triggered during uh, winter temperatures or, um, and it turns on emergency cold weather shelter. Once temperatures reach above 45 degrees, uh, we'll talk about how we can maintain shelter capacity through that. Um, we're going to talk about our assumptions, what we assume going into the summer, and um, how that uh, plays into our plan. Uh, we're going to offer a menu of options today, what, what we know are available, what we think could come available, and we're going to present it as a menu. Uh, we're also going to talk about safe sleeping areas. I know that this is a um, something that has, has been talked about, but not in depth, and last year with Centennial. Uh, this is going to be a more in-depth research, what it would require to have an actual outdoor sanctioned camping area in the municipality if we so choose to go that way. Um, and then just to talk about an RFP timeline and expectations for that. Um, next slide, please. All right, so according to Anchorage Municipal Code 16.120, this is the code that triggers when temperatures drop below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's how we can turn on emergency cold weather shelters within our municipality, uh, bypass zoning, turn on uh, these shelters. So it's activated under three reasons, or three assumptions. So the mayor can either declare a civil emergency, the director can write uh, determine in writing that something, some sort of danger poses a risk to health and safety of unsheltered individuals, or it automatically triggers when temperatures drop below 45 degrees. The provision, uh, the third one, where the director determines in writing, this was triggered during COVID. That was how we maintained the Sullivan uh, for two and a half years during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an overall capacity map um, in funding that we have through April 30th. So the appropriation that you guys uh, will have on your next assembly agenda, AR 2023-43, um, this covers all the finances through April 30th, with the exception of Covenant House. Covenant House's proposal that they put forward only goes through March 31st. Um, so just a brief overview, we have family sheltering with Christian Health Associates, we're averaging about eight families. Um, Covenant House increased their capacity by 25 guests. These are for transition age youth 18 through 24. Um, and you can see the cost per guest underneath them. The Alex is maintaining about 100 clients a night uh, at 50 rooms, and um, that's maintained through April. The Sullivan is currently at a 360 capacity. This capacity is only available through March 31st at this time. That's what the assembly had approved at their last, um, last meeting, the extension of uh, the 360 guests. So if we want to maintain 360 beyond March 31st, we'll request that uh, to the assembly. Um, we're averaging roughly 290 people a night. Um, that's from the beginning of this emergency cold weather through now. Last night we saw 354 people inside. Um, and then as you know, the ADA is on the demobilization plan. 
Uh, they have pushed back their timeline a little bit uh, to take in uh, or continuing sheltering people, um, but we do know that they will be closing in April uh, for the majority of their residents. They have told us that they will leave 18 rooms available up to 21 guests, um, but it is the most expensive route beyond April 30th. Uh, and we'll get to that in the presentation. Next slide, please. So as far as our assumptions moving forward, when we sat down to make this plan, we knew that cold weather, emergency cold weather sheltering was ending on April 30th. Um, under AMC 16.120. Without a replacement for congregate shelter, we believe that the Sullivan will need to remain open if we want to continue sheltering people through summer. Um, if there is another congregate location made available, which you'll see later in the slide, uh, we could demobilize the Sullivan Arena. Uh, we assume that clients moving into housing without a source of income, we know that there's three housing units that will be coming on or facilities that are coming online in the coming months. Uh, the Barrett Inn will have 96 units, but we only believe about 50 will come online by May 1st, um, and there will be no additional funding needed um, to turn that on. The Lakeshore will have 45 housing units, and we believe that will be filled by the end of March. Um, the Gold Mine, as you know, has 85 housing units. We will uh, be requesting a 700, roughly $700,000 appropriation uh, to bring that up to code to make it a habitable living space. Um, the timeline that was given to me was that it was going to be six to nine months. Um, you know, I'm working as hard as I can to get that online as soon as possible because these housing units are needed. Uh, one thing that hasn't been discussed yet is the Old Alaska Native Charter School. We had a private donor come forward and offer to purchase this building for us, um, close in roughly 45 days, and they would lease it to the municipality on a five year lease for $100,000 a month. Um, this would is zoned properly. Um, but it would need a CUP, so we'd have to go through the CUP process unless we trigger the $16.20. This would allow for 150 people um, to be sheltered in that location. Um, and then the last thing that we assumed would be that people during summertime would opt to camp out even if shelter space was available. Next slide, please. Perfect, so these are the locations and options that we have uh, looked into that we think are readily available uh, that could be turned on during the summer. So the Alaska Native Charter School, or the old Alaska Native Charter School, I'm sorry, could opt as a new navigation and shelter. It's uh, roughly $5.3 million a year, uh, averaging about ninety-seven ninety per guest. Um, you'll see on the next slide that there's a solo generating capacity, but we'll go back to that. The non-congregate option at the AU year beyond April 30th is the most expensive option. They've made 18 rooms available for up to 21 people, and it's $170 per guest per night. The reason it's so high is because they do have to maintain um, a certain level of resource um, personnel, and because just because there's less people doesn't mean that the uh, resources are not going to be made available, so it's very expensive. We know that the housing options that are coming online are very little make sure and line. And then one more option that we're going to talk about later today, if it's the will of the community, um, with the support of the assembly and the administration and hopefully the coalition, we want to talk about some safe sleeping areas if that is the will of the community. This is not a plan that we are putting forward, it's just an option that we would like to continue to discuss. Next slide, please. So Sullivan Arena. For the next five months, um, after April 30th, if we continue operating Sullivan Arena, we would not have a warming facility. There would not be a day engagement hangout center. Uh, if you are on Sullivan Arena, you have to be there um, as a resident. The cost for that is $1.7 for 150 guests. That cost goes down per person per night. The more people um, that you put into the Sullivan Arena because of economies to, to scale. Um, but we would require a trigger of the 16120 for it to operate through summer. This is the most fiscally responsible option that we found, um, but it does congregate a large number of people uh, indoor in one facility. Next slide, please. So option one. This is triggering all options. Um, this would turn on the Sullivan Arena. We would decrease capacity to 150 guests over the summer. There would be no warming shelter. Uh, we would continue the aviator at the most expensive option, but we would still allow for 21-ish people to be there. Um, 18 rooms. We are planning to continue on with the Barrett and the Lakeshore, um, from what I'm hearing from our private partners. And then we would also turn on a safe sleeping site. And we'll get to the safe sleeping site a little bit later in the slides. Next. 
This is option two. Uh, this is the exact same option, 150 people at the Sullivan Arena. But we would not turn on the AV or be on April 30th because it is so expensive. Uh, this would include a safe sleeping area and our housing options. This takes the cost from, I believe, $89 to $82 per person per night. Uh, but you'll see in slide three a more uh, fiscally conservative option. Option three, please. Thank you. So this is the Sullivan Arena, and it includes housing. Other than that, we would not turn on a safe sleeping site in the municipality, and we would not offer non congregate as a, a hotel becomes the most expensive option. We would continue to request an increased capacity of 360 at the Sullivan Arena, um, but we would still not have a warming area, and this would still need to be triggered under 60 dollars money. Next slide, please. So I'm going to introduce Michael Hughes. Uh, he's done extensive research on safe sleeping sites and safe, excuse me, safe sleeping areas. Um, we've seen some success around the United States, and so he's going to deep dive into that. This is not part of the plan. It's just an option that we would like to continue to discuss if it's the will of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about safe sleeping areas. Next slide, please. Uh, so basically, my research has brought me to HUD, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, uh, cities across the lower 48, uh, key studies and technical, technical documents, and I've talked to some providers who've actually done some of these safe sleeping sites. Uh, next slide, please. And so basically, it is a uh, common practice, and uh, it's not something that is done in every single place, but uh, there are a variety of organizations that have different opinions, but it is a uh, common practice. So basically, uh, best practices, some of them include uh, scattered sites of up to 150 people, um, smaller sites that would create safer and healthier spaces for everyone, and also um, guests would include any individual or family who wishes to be a part of the safe sleeping area. So of course, one possibility would be Centennial. However, of many other cities uh, use things like parking lots, parks, or other open locations. And so at this point, um, just from a research best practices perspective, I think anything would be on the table if the city would uh, decide to go through with it. It would also be fenced. Uh, best practices, uh, basically every place that I've come across has shown that a uh, contained area is for the sake of the guests staying there. Um, it provides, it protects against wild animals in the case of Anchorage, uh, and also any other violent individuals who have to leave the site and just any other dangers. So again, uh, just to be really clear, for the sake of guests. And fences would also have an alarmed exit. Uh, we would also recommend, um, for best practices, if they share. Can we ask questions as we go on, or do you want us to hold them? Um, I think it would be beneficial for us to hold until the end. And basically, the provider would supply waste bags and those rules for keeping pets so that the space stays well organized. Next slide. Then, uh, basically, the setup of the whole tent area would be to create an organized, safe place uh, so you know where each guest is. So, for example, guests would bring their own tents or be offered a tent by the provider. Uh, they would open in the same direction if possible. For example, in the case of Centennial, they would open towards that road. In the case of a different site, they would open towards a common path. And each guest would be assigned a 12 by 12 camping site with kind of a number by it or a lettering system. And so the provider knows where everyone is at every time so they can receive adequate services, food, etc. Uh, collaboration would also be important to making this a success. So uh, some ideas include collaboration with ABD, with the Health Department of Public Health Nurses for outdoor sanitation standards, with the Anchorage Fire Department for an evacuation plan in case of wild fire danger, and also with nonprofits or hospitals to clarify the role of these safe sleeping areas, their capacity, whether they will admit people if they're just dropped off or not. Um, another best practice is wellness checks. So wellness, if you think of the solo thing where you kind of just see everyone sleeping, um, the idea is that you can see everyone at the Sullivan, but you can't see everyone inside of tents. And so as you walk around, just to make sure that everyone is okay, there's no one in crisis, uh, you kind of go by tents and ask simple questions like, um, are you doing okay today? Um, and you'd ask tents, yes, to open their tents. But you would not do basic things like enter tents or ask uh, hyper-personal questions. Next slide. Laundry services could be provided by a mobile trailer 
or on-site or return service. We've seen some providers in the lower 48 do this. And uh, this is just one provider case study. This is not necessarily our recommendation, but it has been successful in several cities to have um, a guest service practitioner ratio of 1 to 15. These are basically people who ensure the health, safety, comfort of all guests, and ensure cleanliness and smooth operation of the site. And a 1 to 20 care coordinators ratio, who basically help each guest develop and implement a housing-focused service plan and plan and facilitate activities and events at the site. So we would uh, be interested in not just offering uh, food and laundry services, et cetera, but also um, peer support, same as you see at the Sullivan. Uh, and finally, a request for proposal would be the best way to obtain the most qualified provider, but Ms. Johnson will go into that later in the presentation. Next slide. We also presented to the task force, and we received a really good uh, feedback in that if we were to uh, want to move forward with safe sleeping areas, one possibility is to hold somewhat of a town hall at Sullivan, uh, talk to guests about what they're going to do for summer anyways, uh, give some options, see which they prefer, and talk about what guests would want, uh, what would actually lead them to stay in a safe sleeping area, should that be an option. And now I'm going to hand the presentation back to Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Perfect. And I just want to get on record and put this on the slide. Um, as far as outreach goes, currently ACH and Healthy Spaces have regular communication. Uh, as far as outreach coordination during Healthy Spaces cleanup, we are not currently abating camps, uh, but we are still doing outreach. Um, and then from what our standpoint is now and what we've been told, safe sleeping areas do not count as available shelter rest under Martin B. Boise, and you cannot abate other camping areas um, such as Chester Creek Greenbelt or Davis Park, um, just because you have available safe or available space at a safe sleeping area. Um, we did receive some communication from um, the community about Missoula, um, and Missoula has made it so it's illegal to camp everywhere except for a safe sleeping area, but from the guidance that we received, it does not qualify under abatement. So that's the plan for us moving forward, um, that we will not be able to abate other spaces um, if this site is made available. Next slide, please. So potential code changes. This is one thing I want to talk about. As you know, Centennial Campground is the only legal place to camp within the municipality. Not to say that we should have a safe sleeping area at Centennial moving forward, but if we did want to have multiple or scattered sites or smaller sites around the municipality, we would have to present code changes for those places. Um, there was discussion about historical, um, where people experiencing homelessness historically camped, and possibly just bringing resources, fencing, et cetera, um, to those historic sites, which would be Davis Park, Russian Jack, the abandoned archive site, but that's not something we're bound to. Those are just discussion topics at the time. Um, and then we would need a potential code change if we were to bring forward pallet homes um, or tiny houses. That's one of the things that people bring up all the time. Uh, can we just build tiny homes? And the answer is yes, but we would require code changes for that. Funding. So there is currently not an identified funding source for any plan moving beyond April 30th. Um, as you know, emergency cold weather shelter was not funded by the uh, assembly, and we are reallocating and re requesting a reappropriation of 2022 alcohol tax funding for this purpose. Um, I do agree that funding should be allocated towards housing and not towards sheltering, um, but because we are currently in an emergency cold weather sheltering, that was the only funding source currently identified. Um, another thing I just want to put on record, and I continue to put on record, is we do not have. Uh, emergency shelter funds for October through December of this year for emergency cold weather shelter as well. Um, and currently all the 2023 alcohol tax has currently been uh, allocated. Next slide, please. Lastly, if it is the will of the community to have a safe sleeping area or safe sleeping areas, um, we will need to put out an RFP and that takes roughly 17 weeks. There are ways for us to get uh, to a provider's sooner, but this is the proposal that we uh, would best like to follow, which is a 17-week RFP. And next slide, we can take any questions or concerns. Great, thanks. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Mr. Sol myself and then Mr. Boland. 
Thank you, Chair. So, appreciate the presentation. Um, not against safe sleeping areas, as I think there's probably a portion of the population that prefers to be outside or outdoors. I was curious on your, it'd be nice if you could have on your different options the number that would go unhoused by each one, so we could evaluate it that way as well. Thank you. Thanks, and I think um, just to make sure we're clear on terminology, do you mean unsheltered? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Did you have anything else, Mr. Salt? Okay. I have a list, but I'm going to go ahead and just um, do a few and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Hull and put myself back in. Okay, so um, first, I think. Um, just uh, for future reference for the administration, um, if you are going to be presenting uh, a detailed plan like this with a lot of numbers and moving parts to the assembly, I think it would be beneficial if you sent the slides in advance so that we could chew on them a bit before the committee. Um, but I appreciate you uh, having this presentation before us today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, queries into the sanctioned camps and, and first I will just say uh, I appreciate the branding that you're attempting to do here with safe sleeping spaces um, but I guess I am curious to explore that a little bit so and I also I think it's a little bit disingenuous to claim that safe sleeping spaces aren't a part of the plan when it is in fact included in two of your three options. So it is a part of two of your three plans that you have presented before the assembly today and I think that needs to be super clear. Um, so why 150 people at the sanctioned uh, camps? Where did that number come from? Sure, uh, thanks for the question through the chair. Um, the number came from uh, best practices that we read a lot, I read online from a variety of different sources, and I believe the 150 specifically came from one organization that uh, operates these spaces in multiple cities successfully across the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, will the administration treat uh, these uh, sanctioned camps as homelessness responses? Through the chair, yes. Yeah. So if we decide, um, as a community that Anchorage is ready for a safe sleeping site, this will be part of a homelessness response. Um, if you go back to the slide, Travis, sort of talks, um, you'll see that the funding to have the Sullivan Arena is similar to the funding to have a safe sleeping site. So the resources would be um, similar. Uh, and one of the startup costs, one of the reasons it is so expensive in the beginning would be to add a fence to the site. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that the administration has finally come to reality and realized that these camps are in fact homelessness responses. Um, one last thing before I turn it over to Mr. Boland and then I'll put myself back in the queue. So um, I want to disagree with the statements that was made uh, that we don't have emergency shelter funds for October to December. I'm not sure if that is accurate. I think we should get a better understanding of that at the Budget and Finance Committee tomorrow. I know OMB is going to be um, talking about the alcohol tax, both 2022 unspent and 2023 allocated. Um, okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Goldman. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a couple questions and a couple thoughts. Um, I'll start with a thought, number one. Do support the idea of exploring code changes that would allow pallet houses, tiny homes. Um, I will say we were considering that when we were contemplating uh, taking discarded uh, ASD molds. Um, but then we had a work session about it, and the assembly recommended. So amendments, changes, and those were never brought forward. And so I don't know if that was kind of trouble to drop the ball no matter what, but it would be great to see that come back before us with those suggested changes um, taken into account. Um, I will not be supporting any, once the emergency um, 
cold weather shelter is deactivated per Chapter 16, Lot 20, I'm not going to be supporting any extension of the solar in arena um, used as a congregate shelter. The solar in arena is a hockey arena, event space. It's time to restore its purpose. Um, and then I appreciate that you said you've done a lot of research on these safe sleeping sites. I would appreciate if perhaps you could share the email list of sources or citations um, that have informed your research. That would be helpful for the body. And then um, presenting the solar array as a most fiscally responsible option, I think, is, is a more complex question. I think you have to also consider the cost to the quality of life in the neighborhood which I am still continue, continuing to hear ongoing concerns about, um, despite the fact that we have uh, ABD overtime patrols in the neighborhood. Um, and then you also need to consider the cost to the unhoused population, shelter, but still unhoused population. And then lastly, my, my question is about um, the fencing of these uh, safe sleeping sites. Um, alarmed access, and that just kind of seems a little crazy to me, um, optics-wise. Can, can you maybe speak to why the fences would need to be alarmed? Are people free to come and go as they please? Thanks for the question, for the chair. Um, yes, I know that, like, for example, when I first got into research and I saw that all the safe sleeping areas across the country that exist were fenced, it was optics-wise strange to me, too. Um, but the more that I talked to providers specifically, and just, um, it's basically just to really protect people. So for example, if someone's trying to break in, um, sometimes there are, like maybe, not so much in Alaska, but other uh, states, there are cartels who, for example, will have um, access to prey on vulnerable individuals if there's no fence. And so just the, the, the alarm is basically just there to protect people uh, based on trauma and error that has happened and lessons learned, essentially. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr. Cross? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I like that we're having this conversation about creating safe camping areas because camping areas already exist. They're just not safe. They're everywhere. And, uh, and some of them are rather large, if you were to look. Uh, in fact, they're like small neighborhoods and they're scattered around in town. They're extremely dangerous for the individuals who are living there. So, you know, I don't think it's like we're, could, I don't think it's, this is like the old analogy of, you know, um, uh, providing contraceptive to youth because they're going to do it, so you try to make it as safe as you can. Homeless, you know, that there's individuals that don't feel safe in the shelter, for whatever reason, I think it's a very important uh, question to have as far as providing a safe area. The fence I see as it being a, a critical attribute because I visited the Centennial somewhere between six and 12 times because I would stop by and go out to the river. And one of the issues you have at the campground is, yeah, not just the safety of the individual, we talked about the wildlife concerns, but also there were a handful of individuals that were um, looting from the neighboring neighborhoods. And there were some that had four and five grills and they had stuff that had been obviously stolen. We had multiple police reports and public safety meetings and the neighbors were in droves. And so I think it also provides that one or two bad players or a handful of individuals that are not, um, that are they're taking advantage of the situation are not taking from the neighborhoods and then pulling it into the trees and seeing it in, which they were doing, they were stealing from neighborhoods and coming into the trees and Centennial. I don't think that's good for the neighbors. So the location of these is gonna to have to be critical where we put them. Um, other states, I've already done a bunch of research on this because I think it's a good idea. You, they do not need, they cannot be part of existing campgrounds. Those cause miserable failures. It just was not a good tradition of mixing the two, which were tours camp and weather is a completely different level of service. You need a higher level of service for the, the, the state campgrounds um, as you do for the state of the recreational camp, who brings a lot of other resources with them. I think we just got to look at trash and security. That was a big concern at Centennial. There was a security and, it was, and there was a lot of trash. So I think that's going to be a big part of the budget to speak it up. Um, I also agree with Dan. I will not support further uh, extensions to Sullivan Arena. Midtown has been hit un unreasonably hard with, uh, with shouldering the burden of our homeless situation in Midtown and downtown. And we need to diversify some of that and those services. 
um, because of the Anchorage problem, not just the Midtown downtown problem. And then finally, um, the code change. You know, we talked about it at a homeless summit. And I'm going to bring that up at the CDC regarding tiny, tiny houses. I already have it down there. I think that's an excellent thing to look at. We've already talked about lot sizes at the CDC. We look at different things. But what can we do to intentionally create an environment? Or is there a specific code? What can we look at that will allow us to build uh, tiny structures? Because it's that mix between not being, because of Martin Boise, not being able to. Um, to, to assist people out of these unsanctioned campgrounds and housing, but then also not have to buy an apartment building. So how do we how do we find an affordable aggregate in there that, that meets the qualifications to provide housing at an affordable level? And maybe those structures are how we reach that. And if that's a code change, that's something that we're capable of doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Um, and actually, sorry, before you begin, I do want to note for the record that uh, Ms. LaFrance has joined us. And I forgot to mention this earlier, um, but um, I want to appreciate um, that there are probably quite a few folks who are attending the third app resource and navigation center um, celebration that's happening right now. Um, but thanks. So congratulations to, to Catholic Social Services for uh, opening up this new wonderful asset. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know I was wondering about that time. I'm sure a lot of us would like to be here to celebrate their accomplishment. Um, uh, this is so frustrating um, for those of us who've been working on this for years. It feels like the plan is just to spend a shit ton of money moving people back and forth for ever, I guess. I, I mean, if we didn't have what the coalition has done and what Rasmussen and Whitener has done, that's the only progress that's been made in, um, you know, however many long months these have been since July 2021. So it's just so frustrating to sit here and imagine shipping people off to a place that's cold where people literally died. Um, I just, I can't believe this is all you all have accomplished. Honestly, um, it's really sad. Uh, the Sullivan is not the most fiscally responsible option. If we keep people in Sullivan forever, there are neighborhood impacts, obviously, but beyond that, there are fiscal impacts, right? So if you keep people in shelter, you just keep people in shelter forever. The most fiscally responsible option is housing, and I think why you're in Rasmussen and Coalition and um, Affordable Housing Land Trust for moving forward on that, and we have them to thank. They're the ones who have made progress on that with the assembly support. So thank you. Um, the Golden Lion, you know, will be ready in six to nine months. The administration's been saying that for six to nine months. We bought the property in December of 2020. Um, we did some renovations on it. There's extra money sitting around to use for additional renovations. So uh, they're just stalling, um, and that's sad, uh, because it could actually be a solution for people. The alarmed fence, I don't want to be hyperbolic, so I'm not going to say what that reminds me of, but I think everyone knows um, what a terrible, both optics and sort of philosophical and human treatment idea that sounds like. Um, and lastly, I'd like to ask the coalition to come up and respond uh, and share their thoughts on what they think of these ideas. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Alatomo, as a new director of the Anchorage Coalition and Homelessness. I can't help but see this plan in the light of going up to Centennial Campground last year. Um, I think that this plan of trying to continue to use the Sullivan Arena and camping perpetuates a system of instability and trauma for the people experiencing homelessness. Um, we, if we think back to when we had mass care, and we had to start to decommission some of those sites, whether it was the former Sockeye Inn or the Alex Hotel. We, as a coalition with providers, led housing intensive weeks leading up to those decommissions where we housed everyone coming out of those facilities. We were making great progress last year in the Sullivan Arena before we got a 30 day notice that it would be closing and people started to scatter. We have real solutions that could 
be put forward, um, especially if you are looking at a cost of millions of dollars to try to keep people safe sleeping outside. So I want to break that up into two pieces. One, the real solutions are the gold line for housing, finding a permanent low barrier shelter like the Arctic Rec Center, which also has an opportunity for housing, and then two hotel conversions. Um, those meet what they, they those start to meet what the identified gap is in um, need for capacity. On with regard to emergency shelter, what we're not seeing with the emergency cold weather shelter is a focus on housing. The basic tenet of shelter is that it is housing focused from the outset. That as soon as you walk in, we're talking about the plan to move the housing. What do we need to do? We are doing that with outreach. We meet someone, we gain their trust, they're willing to talk with us, we're like, let's get you into HMIS and let's get you on coordinated entry. We want to get you from your current place, point A, to house as fast as possible. For some, that will be a stop in emergency shelter because that's what they choose and that's what they want to do. For others, we meet them where they're at and we focus on housing. If you're going to spend $77 a day for safe sleeping spaces, invest in outreach. We can do this. We are doing this. Um, to simply suggest everyone should camp in one space, you are creating a problem. Um, or there is the potential to create that problem. Our current camps and encampments do not have significant bear issues. They do not have shootings. I do not have to tell our staff they cannot go into them because they are unsafe. This is very frustrating to hear. And if a campground is set up again like Centennial was last year, outreach will not go in it. It was unsafe. And it is heartbreaking to not be able to serve people because unsafe conditions exist. We won't even get started on fencing and how that treats people with less than human dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peterson? <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It seems like we're headed back to the future. My, my question is, what, what will be the difference this year uh, in how Centennial Park is managed compared to last year? Through the chair, Mr. Peterson, I just want to go on record and say that Centennial is not part of a plan. I just want to have the discussion about an outdoor safe sleeping site if that's the will of the community. If it is not, and Anchorage is not ready for an outdoor camp, then Centennial will not be stood up. The question is, is are we going to have a response to Centennial if it is stood up? My viewpoint of it is if we are going to have an outdoor safe sleeping area, and whether it be Centennial or somewhere else, vehicle change, we would like to have a mimic of what is successful down to lower 48. We have spent hours and hours with a provider down in California who has duplicated their services in Austin, Albuquerque, and they have told us that a fence is needed to keep people safe inside. It is for predators, people who are preying on people experiencing homelessness. This is not, I understand the optics of it, but this is what they're telling us is best practice. They're doing it in San Francisco in parking lots, and they're telling us this is the safest way to do so. They said no more than 150 people. Last year we saw 280 people at Centennial. We learned a lot from that campground, and now if Anchorage is ready to have a safe sleeping area, these are the things that we would like to bring forward to make it the safest, best place for people to camp if they so choose. We will not be busing people out of Sullivan to Centennial Campground or any safe sleeping area. This is a client choice, um, and we will not be sh shutting down Sullivan and opening a safe sleeping site in lieu of that. So this is a two-pronged option that we are presenting today. It would be to maintain shelter space, but also offer an outdoor camping area. I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> so, so you're still so you're thinking you might keep everyone in Southern Marina instead of opening up safe safe camping up in, in, in Centennial. 
so these are just only our options for us to make decisions on today. This isn't uh, uh, administration's plan moving forward. Through the chair, Mr. Peterson, I don't believe we can make official action today, but I could, could be wrong. Um, basically, the proposal that we put forward was exploring all options. If we did not want to maintain capacity at the Sullivan Arena beyond 360, which I know some people have on the body have commented on, and we wanted to go down to 150, we would have to also offer other areas. And we know that the assumption moving forward is that people will want to opt to sleep outside in camp. I understand that we are housing first, that's our priority. Um, and if that's the will of the community and we find new housing options, we would love to reallocate or ask for appropriations for those types of projects. But right now, as far as how many people are in the Sullivan um, and our options, continuing the Sullivan is the only concrete shelter option that we see moving forward beyond summer. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So I'm next in the queue and then Mr. Boland. Uh, I want to know for the record that Mr. Sweet joined us about 10 minutes ago or so. Um, so I have a few questions, uh, but before I get to that, I just want to make a comment because this has been um, brought up a couple of times and I think it's just extremely frustrating to hear the administration just continue to lie when it says that sanctioned camps are not a part of the plan. You can go to the slides, folks. You saw it. Option one, slave, safe sleeping area, sanctioned camps, part of the plan. Option two, safe sleeping area, sanctioned camps, part of the plan. Option three, not part of the plan. That is a much more transparent and truthful way about talking about this to the public. With that, I'll go to my questions. Um, so, first is around the Barrett and Lake Shore. So, one of your slides had talked about um, some dates that you had and the number of units. Can you just confirm who you talked to uh, to confirm that information is accurate? Through the chair, our initial connection was with the Rasmussen Foundation. This was the uh, data that they gave us, and then we presented to the coalition. Um, Demobilization Task Force and their subcommittee, and these numbers were confirmed by them. Those were last updated last Thursday. If there's new information coming to light, we'd be happy to update the slides. Okay, thank you. Um, so, in the spirit of verification, I just want to turn to just to make sure that that is accurate. From okay, I'm getting head nods from the coalition. Thank you. Um, okay, so then my next uh, question: How many people? Um, sort of the inverse of the question that Mr. Salt asked, which was how many would go unsheltered under each of these options? Um, how many people would um, do each of your options account for? Like, what's your total nexus here? Through the chair, we're seeing roughly 566 people on average per night. The height that we're seeing is around 650 people accessing emergency cool weather shelter. If the 45 units come on at the lakeshore and the 50 come on at the Barrett, that negates 95. So if you're looking at 550 people, the options that we put forward uh, are roughly 360 at max, 300 at uh, the least. So you're looking at 200, roughly a delta of 200 people going unsheltered and unhoused. Okay, thanks. Um, then next is, um, so is the administration going to be bringing forward code changes? You mentioned that several times. Through the chair, I think the, the way I viewed it is if, you know, we meet with the coalition and we meet with the task force and we're meeting with community providers. I have a meeting today with um, some local community leaders that have a desire to solve homelessness. We're continuing the ongoing conversations to see what the will of the city is. Um, I think last year when we came forward with um, fire mitigation plans to open Centennial, one of the biggest things we heard was you didn't ask enough people, you didn't tell, talk to enough people, and so I'm covering my bases as far as who I'm talking to. I'm always having a conversation. I'm always open to having that with whoever I, like, whoever I need to. Um, moving forward, if it's not the will of the community, then I won't be bringing forward code changes. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that we are trying to collaborate as best we can. And if that's not the will of the city, and that's not the will of the leader, local leaders and providers and nonprofits, 
that I will not be bringing to them changes. Okay, thanks for that clarification. A uh, couple other questions before I go back into the queue. <clears throat> so the I was pretty stunned by the slide around the dollar figures with the Alaska Native Charter School. Um, so that is a lot of money per year. Um, $5.36 million per year. Um, that's just a big number. Is that a part of the long-term vision from the administration? Through the chair, that was just an option that was brought forward to us. $5.3 million for operations uh, is similar to what we're seeing at the Sullivan Arena. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, the most expensive part of the Alaska Native Charter School was the leasing um, of it. It has a high monthly lease compared to the Sullivan Arena because we don't pay a lease to ourselves. Um, but if that is, again, the will of the community, and we want to look into leasing that facility, that is an option for us. Again, this is a proposal and a menu of options. This is not a plan that we're bringing forward. We're just laying out all the options that we see available. I won't beat that uh, drum anymore. Um, so does this mean that the administration is giving up on the Tudor and Elmore site? Through the chair, no. At our last housing and homelessness committee meeting, you had asked if the navigation center was going to be part of our demobilization plan. Um, and it was my stance that we are realistic and that we wouldn't be able to get the uh, Tudor and Elmore navigation center stood up by April 30th. And so we would not be including it as part of a plan. Uh, had this been fully funded in you know, the prior months, we could have absolutely demobilized the Sullivan Arena and placed people on Twitter and Elmore. Yeah, that's a bit of a fair tale, but okay. Um, so what services would you offer at the Sullivan so it doesn't stay open as shelter forever? Through the chair, I have... Um, I believe someone from Henning here to talk about the operations that are currently being provided at the Sullivan. Uh, there is peer support, housing navigators. We do see street outreach from the coalition as well. Um, there's also access to sobriety, substance misuse, treatment facilities, detox beds, all the resources that are normally made available at navigation center are being made available at the Sullivan. Right okay, so the, the answer is there's no, you're not planning any difference then between what you offer now and what you plan to offer in the future under your plans? Through the chair, um, through this proposal, it's funded at the same level. Um, if there's something that is not being offered at the Sullivan currently that you see in before, we, uh, we would be happy to discuss that. Sure, there's certainly a lot to discuss regarding the Sullivan. Um, okay, I think that uh, pretty much covers the questions I have, so I'll come back. Um, actually, I have one more question, and then I'll go to Mr. Boland. Um, so, the uh, Emergency Shelter Task Force will be providing formal written comments at some point, is that correct? So, I think your next meeting, so I, I got it just for the record, I got a head nod. Uh, I think your next meeting to consider comments is Tuesday, February 21st. So, do you imagine at some point after that meeting we may get comments? Okay, so for the record again, that's a, a head nod, yes. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and turn to Mr. Boland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, I just find it really concerning, I guess I'll reiterate my earlier point, that the Sullivan Arena now has become the indefinite default for congregate shelter in the municipality. And, you know, not only are we considering extending it as emergency cold weather shelter, despite the fact that there will no longer be cold weather. Um, I think we heard just now from the administration that uh, they don't see another path forward or another location. And, and perhaps, I mean, I guess the only example would be the old Alaska Navy Charter School location. Um, I guess I have two questions. Have the has the administration in the last few months been looking at other potential permanent locations for congregate shelter? And if so, what are those locations? And then, let's see, what was my other question? Well, I'll ask that first, and I'll think about me. My second question was. Through, so, the, through 
the trainers are willing. Thanks for the question. Uh, we have looked at other alternative sites, but nothing that would be ready to turn on by April 30th. Uh, there has been ongoing discussions with the coalition and uh, the demobilization task force for other sites around town, uh, but they're not zoned properly. They would require COP, um, and we would be behind the times as far as um, getting this readily available by April 30th. Um, as always, we would like to continue the conversation surrounding the Tudor Elmore shelter. Um, but other than that, we did not see anything that would be readily available within the next 45 to 90 days. Okay, I thought there were some questions. Okay. Um, can you share with us who the private donor is for the Rural Alaska Native Charter School location? Through the chair, I would respectfully decline to answer that at this time. Okay, I think that would be a key piece of information for me in order to do that for Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to note for the record that um, Ms. Dern has been um, on the phone since 11.30 and she is in the queue. I uh, also want to know for members who want to get in the queue, text is the best way. Thanks. Hi, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I am just wondering uh, if you could um, address to me if there's any plan to work on some of these alternative sites that you've mentioned won't necessarily be ready by April 30th, but um, might be sites that in the future could serve the population. Is there any plan in place to try and get this moving forward uh, for, for future housing solutions? Through the chair to Ms. Stern, I think I understand your question. Um, the conversations are ongoing with the other sites that are not currently zoned property, properly or that we have, uh, the conversations continue to happen. I don't think they're ready to be brought forward. There's a lot of uh, hoops that we're currently trying or uh, hurdles we're trying to overcome. Um, but yes, I believe the conversations are continuing and they are ongoing. And so, as I understand it, just so I, uh, from, from my reference, there will be coaching brought forward in order to accommodate some of those potential sites being used for these purposes? Through the trade, Mr. I just want to clarify, are you talking about safe sleeping sites or are you talking about the new possibilities for shelter and housing locations? Uh, I'm sorry, I should not say shelter and housing locations. Through the chair, yes, some of the sites that are currently being discussed would require um, quite a few coaching changes, so they wouldn't have to be brought forward before those could be turned on as a shelter or housing. And that, just out of curiosity, uh, are any of those sites currently um, listed on a vacant or abandoned uh, list, commercial vacant or abandoned list? Through the chair, I wouldn't have an answer to that, but I could definitely keep that into that for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I'm going to go to Ms. Quinn Davidson, then I'm in the queue after, and then um, I think just for the purposes of time, I think we're going to have to move on. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my interest, just sort of in general, is to find outside partners, whether it be the coalition or wider Rasmussen, like we did with the ARPA funds, and um, grant those funds to them because they have success of actually accomplishing things. And so, to that end, I'm, yeah, rather than do a lot of this, honestly. So, to that end, I would love it if Meg or someone from the coalition would talk about the Arctic Rec Center. We sort of heard mention of that, and I've heard a lot of good positive things about it, but I want to know, is that for sale? Could that be something partners could do soon? Like, what are the details? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the Arctic Rec Center is an interesting property because it is the actual rec center which we matured. Um, it is for sale. The sale price is $12.5 million. But it also comes with R3 stone land. That is my understanding, it has the deep utilities laid so that it would be available for subdivision and further development. We've been discussing this in the context of a yes and proposition. Yes, the emergency and immediate response for permanent shelter. Um, we toured it with Mr. Dole from Rasmussen, who has considerable building experience. It's fairly turnkey. It would need very minimal 
um, changes to be suitable as a congregate shelter for up to possibly 120 people. It also has the type of um, layout when you come in that would be conducive to a navigation center. Um, so it could do both. Um, there are even rooms that are plumbed where you could possibly have medical, itinerant medical services, um, case management, those types of things. There's also a commercial kitchen. And while the practice is to use outside providers, looking at downtown Hope Center, they have a wonderful job training that they use a kitchen for. So there's a lot of possibility there. It's very exciting. Um, it could be turned on using Title 16, which is actually how the downtown Hope Center functions in a space that's not currently approved for zoning. Um, and the property could be replatted, and we could work with housing partners while also working with emergency shelter providers all at the same time. So it's quite the possibility. We just have to have the will to want to invest in something like that. Um, that's the capital cost. Of course, the operational cost will be approximately, like Ms. Johnson said, it's about $5 million for 120 people. That's on par with, I think, also what um, Brother Francis's annual operating budget is. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? I know he's not. Um, so is the vision for that with partners, it sounds like you've been talking with Rasmussen and said, like the other side, is the vision that that would be a year-round shelter and navigation center? Yes, slow barrier. Um, you know, men and women will wear. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and amend the queue to allow Ms. LaFrance, who has the token yet, to speak, and then I will go ahead and close off this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, I had wanted to ask about the Arctic Rec Center as well. And, um, but first, a question, and apologies um, for me, I was at the Third Avenue Navigation Center celebration, which was wonderful. Um, the Alaska Native Charter School, just so I'm tracking, this is a new piece in this conversation, yes, and um, I heard that you know, there's a pretty high cost associated with the lease, but then I, I heard um, Mr. Bowen's question about um, a donor. So, I mean, is somebody wanting to ultimately give this facility to the municipality? Through the chair, Ms. LaFrance, um, we had a private donor come forward and offer to purchase this in order to lease it to the city on a five-year lease um, if we wanted to get out of this whole event. So that was just an option that was brought forward to us. Uh, I figured I would present it. That was a little of, a little of the body, and so um, it's not part of the plan. It's just an option that we're, we're giving forward in the proposal. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I won't ask you any questions then about what the cost of renovation would be. I would just um, see as I um, said before in other meetings, that I would really like the municipality to get it out of the homelessness response business and um, embrace the role that I believe an, um, an anchored plan, an anchored home plan, where we provide support through public safety, securing any state and federal funds, allocating alcohol tax money, and then support um, the partners. And um, you know, to Ms. Davidson's point, I would really like to pursue the Arctic Rec Center through um, the relationships we have with partners because I feel very confident when funds are um, conveyed to these organizations who you know have a track record of doing this and a growing track record too. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude this conversation um, and then move us on. So um, I, I will just say that this has been a really disappointing presentation. Um, this plan does not focus on housing first, which is the adopted policy of the municipality, and it does not focus on wise investments on permanent solutions. It has the potential to put people in harm, which is really alarming to me. So there are huge opportunities that we have before us, like the Arctic Rec Center, which some of my colleagues have mentioned. So, like what's happened in the past, when the administration comes up with a quote-unquote plan, I will thank them for their efforts, so thank you, and look to work with community experts to provide the real solutions. With that, let's go ahead and move on. Um, and actually, a good segue that Ms. LaFrance provided, um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the Anchored Home update. 
because that is timely, and if we don't do it now, we won't have it until um, possibly April. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Alan, Tom, and Executive Director of the Anchorage um, Coalition and Homelessness. So we are excited to talk with you today to present Anchorage's five years strategic plan to address homelessness anchored home. Um, I know that people have been anxious to see anchored home, um, but I want to frame this in not a new plan, but a continuation of the work that's really been underway. What you'll see here is a lean strategic plan with a very specific focus aligned with federal strategic goals and homelessness. Overall, this plan isn't revolutionary, but it encapsulates the work we've already done for the past year, bringing on housing, meeting clients' needs where they are, and expanding the system. Continuing this path is the path to ending homelessness. We know this work, we can do this work, and I'm really excited to share this plan with you today. Next slide. So to frame the plan, um, I want to start with this premise, and we don't talk about this much as a community, but homelessness is a public health crisis. People experiencing homelessness have complex health challenges. They're the ones we're often talking about when we're talking about the services that need to come with housing, whether that's behavioral health, substance misuse, or chronic medical conditions. And ensuring access to quality health care has to be a part of the community's response to homelessness. Healthcare is most effective when it's integrated with housing assistance. Housing is healthcare. Next slide, please. So the other piece to the puzzle, frankly, it's a two-piece puzzle, is that homelessness is, the, homelessness is the result of not enough housing. The gap analysis, which you've seen before, we have a need of 2,400 housing units in our community. This is why you will not see that this is a plan to end homelessness in the next five years. We will address it. Hopefully, we will make great progress. And hopefully, at the end of five years, the next five years, next five year plan will be the plan to end homelessness in our community. All right, next slide, please. So this is the framework in which the plan will work. This is the homelessness prevention and response system. This is slightly different than maybe what you've seen before in that it includes prevention, diversion, and retention. If we don't help people retain their housing, we end up right back where we started. Um, and it also illustrates the importance of outreach, emergency shelter, and transitional housing, which is still considered shelter um, as potential pathways to lead into housing. And then the housing blocks all match to gap analysis. So let's jump in. The strategic plan, it's got one goal, strengthen and sustain community implementation of housing first to reduce homelessness with the goal of making homelessness rare, brief, and one time to achieve functional zero. This is our North Star, this is the compass that should drive the work for the next five years. Next slide, please. So, the next couple of slides really are agreements, I think, that the community needs to make. The solution is housing, and everyone is housing ready, and housing first is the key. And I won't read the slide, but this is centered in the fact that housing, when we start with housing and we acknowledge and respect client choice and self-determination, we move in the right direction. Next slide, please. Also, we need to acknowledge that Anchorage is a housing-first community. When a person is housed, they have the platform to meet all of their needs, no matter how complex. And it's not housing only, though, and I think that's where housing first sometimes gets confused. Services are not effective without housing, but housing is not sustainable without services. These go hand in hand. Um, it doesn't take the focus away from housing. It's a housing and. Um, 
proposition. We have to do both. Next slide. So Anchorage can solve homelessness. I think we should just say it, and we should embrace it. Functional zero, where inflow is less than outflow, can be achieved and sustained. And the strategies here, aligned with the federal strategic goals, are what can bring us to functional zero. And we have aligned with the federal strategic goals for the reason that you would all expect. It's where the funding and resources are. The federal government wants to see housing first in action. So I think you, the strategies are on the next slide. And they really will identify the lanes of work moving forward. You'll see that there are seven of them. What you won't see in this plan is how we're going to do it. What we want to do is build a consensus around what we're going to do with our community engagement for the next 60 days and convene and talk with the community and providers and partners about how we want to do it and how we want to report out these metrics and how we want to show success. Next slide. Now, this is a little bit different for a strategic plan, but this is what drives funding on the federal level, system performance measures. These are the things, as we implement the strategic directives, that HUD and other funders are looking for to determine if they should invest in our community. So it's really important that we incorporate those into our plan. And ultimately, on the next slide, please, this is how we're going to measure it. And this is what we already measure. So you should look to us in the next 60 days to be setting baselines to tell you how many people are experiencing homelessness, the length of homelessness, um, as it relates to those strategic directives, so we can keep track of how we're doing. Now, all the strategic directives may not move at once. They'll be prioritized, of course. But it's not hard to tell if we're making progress. And you'll see veterans and families called out there. I believe we can reach functional zero with veterans and family homelessness in the next five years. Other communities are doing it. I don't see why we can't either. Um, and then the last slide um, is just how to engage with us. We really want this plan centered in the community. This is not our plan. It is a plan that we will take responsibility for implementing and convening, but we want the community's buy-in. We want Anchorage to be able to say to itself, we are a housing-first community and we can solve homelessness. Because if we can say that as a community, we can make the right investments to make it a reality. But we have to reach consensus on where our North Star is. And that's housing. Thanks. Great, thank you. Before I go into the queue, which right now is myself and then Mr. Salt, um, I just want to, for purposes of time, because we are going to have to end right at 12.30, there's a, another community meeting at 1 o'clock downtown. Um, how many people uh, in the audience would like to participate in final audience participation? So I can set aside that time. All right, so I just see one individual, two individuals. Okay, I will go ahead and set aside that time, which won't be very much time for this discussion, but that's okay. Um, okay, so then I'll go ahead and go first. Um, so I appreciate very much the vision and the positivity of this presentation. It's very much needed. Um, can you speak to the role of the municipality here? Because I think you spoke a little bit to it, how the previous Anchored Home Plan had pillars and assigned roles, but this one's deviating from that. So if you could speak to that, please. Yeah, of course. I think the municipality brings into multiple strategic directives. Increasing access to housing um, is definitely within the purview of the municipality. It's a foundational piece to this plan. Um, making sure we are sharing and using data in a coordinated way. And I think 
the obvious way is that the participating jurisdiction for HUD funding is the municipality through the health department. Are we bringing and leveraging our, our funds towards the goal, which is to bring on housing units and that funding in particular, and I believe also alcohol tax funding, can be used for the supportive services as well. So I think there are some very key ways um, that we can work together. We hope to see engagement as we set up these lanes of work with policymakers, with our partners, um, within the health department and the participating jurisdiction. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. Mr. Sol? Thank you, so I appreciate the plan and the vision. Although I just can't help but think, had the administration presented this, they would have gotten help me out. So what I'd like to see is, and you guys have a lot of resources, but we need to see how. And I'd like to see you work with the administration to try to bridge these gaps. And, and probably, honestly, the best piece of advice I heard here, was, I can't remember who said it, is the administration can probably get out of all this business. We really don't have any right being in that business. We run a city and let others deal with housing. Um, and from the administration standpoint, I think we'll take a black eye off the off the list for you. Um, because I, 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 I don't think the administration or the should be dealing with this. We should help them provide the funding the extra. So the point of my conversation is I really want to see it out. Really want to see it out of time. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Soul. And what we're doing first is getting consensus around the plan, and we are already working on the meetings to convene so we can talk about the how. We're not the experts. We are convening experts. We have some subject matter expertise, but we have providers and community members and government with decades of experience. We want to bring them all, make sure we have alignment, and then let's set some timelines, let's set some baselines, and then let's measure how we're working towards meeting the goal. Thank you, Mr. Boland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the coalition for your presentation. Um, I, I really appreciate the realism that you are presenting when you say that you know we're it, it's going to be longer than a five-year horizon that we solve um, homelessness or, or address it in full. And I, I guess I would just submit to those who are listening that um, homelessness in Anchorage is going to outlast any mayoral term. And just keep that in mind, you know, if, if there's a, a mayoral candidate who ever comes along and says that they, during one term, are going to uh, solve homelessness or, or take us in a wildly different direction, um, you may want to uh, have your, your BS radar on. Um, on that realistic point, I think, if we could go back to the measuring outcomes slide, Measuring success, perfect. You know, I think um, for right or for wrong, a, a way that a lot of the public measures success has to do with visible homelessness and the outcome that I hear from constituents that they want to see is less visible homelessness camps, fire highways, or inner parks. And I, I guess that leads me to a couple questions. Number one, how do we message success? to the public when we're making strides of progress, but they may, it may be kind of in a visibly tangible, immediate way that they can appreciate. And then should there be a, a measure of success that has to do with, you know, less folks camping because they're housed? Thanks, and I'll take those in reverse order if I may. Um, so the HUD strategic directive is homeless to housed, no stops in shelter if they're not necessary. So we provide um, detailed metrics on outreach through our outreach grant, and we are increasing the contact and the number of people we know to be experiencing homelessness and getting them on a coordinated entry very quickly. So they are getting in a queue for housing. That is success. And I understand it doesn't take care of the visibility issue. With regard to your first question, I actually have a short story to tell you, and I will keep it brief. We don't do enough of this. We recently housed a veteran experiencing disabilities who had been homeless for 20 years, living in a tent and occasionally going to the gospel rescue mission, and he is now housed. That is success. We just have to do that 
over and over and over again. He is housed in one of your investments. That is what we need to do. And one of the reasons you won't see a bunch of data in this plan is the strategy is the same if it's 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, or 5,000 people. We meet each person where they are, and we work toward housing. We just have to have the will to have the housing units and enough capacity for the support of services. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Alasaw, for the presentation. Um, you know, it made me think to when I first came on the body and hearing how I think maybe it was in 2016 or maybe it was before then when Housing First was initially being put forward as a solution to homelessness. My understanding is there was a lot of resistance, and that if you know the anchored home plan would have been presented then, it um, probably would have been no matter who presented it, widely resisted. Widely resisted. However, um, what I saw here today seemed to be um, a continuation of what has been the policy in place now for a few years. And I guess, and I was the one, you know, who had said, and I'll, I want, I, have, I do have a question in this, but I had said that I would like to see the municipality get out of the homelessness response business and fully embrace our role as um, local government in supporting the efforts, in um, being that HUD jurisdiction at all levels that is appropriate for, for a municipality in public safety, public health, short of actually running facilities and um, again playing that support role, facilitating role to the organizations in our community that have that expertise. So with all that, um, when you ask for feedback, are you also wanting feedback on like the role of the local government, or are we assuming that um, what I articulated will probably remain with this plan? That's a great question. Um, I think that the role of local government in support of this plan needs to be driving toward the goal. So if this if the local government is standing up emergency cold water shelter or investing in a low barrier shelter because it meets the gap identified, you need to demand it be housing focused. All roads lead to housing. And I think that's where it's not necessarily how deep the role is necessarily, but how focused the role is. Anything that's not moving folks towards housing isn't in service of this strategic plan and it isn't in service of solving homelessness. But Ms. France, before you continue, I need a motion to extend by five minutes. So moved. Second. Is there any opposition? Okay, seeing none, we're extended to 1235. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Zell, for that. And I guess I just would add to it, recognize that the public safety piece may require the, the local um, government to take an active role in emergency shelter and that piece of it. So I just want to be clear that I'm not saying um, we should do that part of it. But as I, I like what you said about all roads are the ministry of tax, um, I did look at you, Daniel. I can't. I can't stop doing that when the history issue comes up. Um, Leads to housing is really helpful as far as articulating that goal. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right, with that, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and move us on to final audience participation. As you can tell, we have a lot of outstanding items on this agenda, so um, I will be calling a special meeting of this committee likely again in a couple of weeks. Um, so, with that, welcome to have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, James Norton, Fairview Community Council. I was not planning on speaking, but um, I don't see how I cannot. Um, and I know we're short on time, so through the chair, thank you all for your work housing those less fortunate um, and in need in our community. Um, 
Glad to hear about the donor for the Alaska Native Charter School. We need more of these kind of uh, people uh, to help this situation. I do think that is in the low income neighborhood. Um, just wanted to make that um, clear that uh, uh, we'd like to see more of these a little spread out a little bit better uh, in some different kinds of neighborhoods. Um, uh, disappointed to hear about the push on the Golden Lion timeline. We had heard some, some short timelines on that. Um, Member Cross, thank you for bringing up troublesome individuals. This is a big problem. And personally, I don't believe functional zero is possible without first addressing and making a plan with the community for these troublesome individuals. Um, a fair will not be in support of extending the Sullivan past April 30th. Um, thank you to Alexis uh, for working with us. We really appreciate it and you're awesome. Um, this is really, really hard. This is one of the hardest uh, challenges our community faces, and I think that uh, it really needs to be prioritized at the top of, of, of all of our issues. Um, thank you to Henning for working with us. Um, we're going to have a community meeting today. We'd love to have the coalition present. Oh, maybe we zoom in in person. We can uh, let you know about that afterwards. Thank you, uh, Healthy Spaces and ABD, for your work. Um, with the current plans, again, our green belts are going to be overrun with illegal camps again if we don't get our act together now and, and break out old patterns. Um, and that'll include crime again and, uh, and, and uh, making our residents uh, feel unsafe and not able to enjoy the, the beautiful uh, city that we have. Um, glad to hear about the Arctic Rec Center plan. I know the Tudor Navigation Center, you know, we put some funds into that. How it happens doesn't really matter. It's water under the bridge, but we do need uh, um, forward momentum and, and additional housing standard sites. Um, no matter how well we work together, communicate, um, facilitating and allowing concrete shelters will continue to perpetuate the challenges and hardships our communities are facing, um, especially Fairview. Um, uh, there are some issues with some of the housing vouchers. I need to say it. Um, I don't have all the details right now, but um, some of the troublesome individuals we're talking about are causing chaos with property managers, specifically around Fairview and some other places, and I would like to follow up on that another time, but um, we need some more checks and balances on, on how we're uh, getting people into housing, uh, not just doing it as fast as possible, because there's some chaos involved here with property managers, and if they don't allow these uh, things to be facilitated, then we're going to be backtracking. So uh, please uh, work on following through with making sure you know the right folks are in these houses and, and these vouchers are being properly facilitated. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I think there was one other individual who wanted to speak. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sean Bradwich. Uh, I worked with Hank for about six weeks. But before I get started, I understand that some of you uh, acknowledge my grandmother was a Bradwich. So, on um, behalf of my family, to the assembly, thank you. Um, so, uh, I've been with Hank for about six weeks. Um, heard some issues uh, concerning, obviously, the Sullivan um, local business there. And, uh, the Fairview Community Council, so we just um, been going, reaching out to these guys, myself and Matthew Philpott, um, who's also attending, and we're just uh, trying to uh, manifest this, I guess. Um, we met with residents on 16th Avenue, um, obviously uh, in Loki, and uh, Fairview Community Council. Um, let me see. Um, just so you guys know, uh, like Ken, we're making about 500 meals a day um, between the Sullivan Alex and Gibbier locations. Um, the Henning, uh, Henning has about 170 employees. Uh, 100 of them work at uh, the Sullivan. Uh, our ratio is like uh, 1 to 14 and a half and 1 to 21. It just depends on shift change and days off. Um, let's see, uh, the food over there is prepared in a commercial kitchen um, by employees who current have those uh, current sort of safeguards. Uh, we follow all the local, state, and uh, health food safety regulations. Um, currently, we're uh, meeting our congressional, congressional obligations. And uh, thank you. 
Great, thank you, sir. Did you say what your role is at Henning? Uh, oh, uh, just a community liaison. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, we are at the end of our time. Thank you, everyone. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>